Ni hao, and welcome to episode 14 of my Mao's China vlog, the last episode, looking this time at cultural change and religious policy. These are the last topics in the um, broader topic for of social and cultural change. And remember that because um, the whole kind of topic is around the area of change and because it's looking at um, these policies across the whole period from 1949 to 1976, you're quite likely to get um, essay questions at least that focus on change and continuity, perhaps disguised as success failure um, questions were uh, Mao's China's Mao's China Mao's to say Mao's why were Mao's policies successful in dealing with religion or dealing with cultural change um, where you would say well yes look how they changed things here successfully and then perhaps know how they failed and, and that would be in the continuity half. You might also get questions of, of significance where Mao's policies on cultural change are more significant than his policies on education uh, or healthcare, for example, comparing some of the different areas of social or cultural change. And of course, um, this topic could easily come up um, as the source question, in which case they can focus right in on any aspect uh, of the topic. So we're going to start by uh, looking at the broader cultural change label and then um, we'll focus in on religion in the second half. The uh, cultural change that the headlines are uh, that we're looking here at the attacks on traditional culture in towns and in the countryside. Uh, we're looking particularly at the role of Jiang Qing, Mao's wife, um, and we're also looking at the imposition of revolutionary arts and culture. So let's get into that. And the first thing to say is that Mao uh, wanted to create a culture that would appeal to workers, not just the educated elite, which is what culture uh, traditionally um, had had done, had been there for. Um, and that's very much in keeping with a, a communist attitude towards culture in, in any case. Um, and Mao thought that culture was part of what formed people's beliefs. So the idea, and again, that's part of kind of communist ideology, I guess, um, lots of elements therefore of traditional culture needed to be removed because they were reinforcing traditional values um, and they contradicted communist values. So, for example, when uh, land reforms were instituted and, and then collectivization later on, they uh, brought to an end the Lantern Festival, the New Year and festivals of the seasons. We'll come back to some of that uh, when we talk about religious beliefs because they overlap there. The reunification campaigns um, of 1949-50 had a massive impact on Lamaism, Buddhism in Tibet and Islam uh, in Xinjiang province in the northwest uh, and Confucianism and ancestor worship were both condemned as well by the communists who were trying to create, um, I guess, a more uniform society, a more homogenous society where people, all people believed in um, and accepted and drove towards with enthusiasm the communist goal um, of, of socialism. Um, to that end, agit prop groups toured the country trying to encourage communist values. Um, and uh, that was all helped hugely by the Great Leap Forward's policies towards um, in the countryside towards agriculture, because communes were an ideal place in which to monitor and educate or indoctrinate people, depending on your perspective. All of this reached a peak uh, with the Cultural Revolution, fairly obviously. And the Cultural Revolution is called that, of course, because they'd already had a political revolution. And Mao was saying, actually, now, we need to have a cultural revolution. We need to not just change the political structures and institutions of China. We need to change the very fabric of, of how people live and work and think um, beyond that. And we haven't really done that enough. And of course, he was saying that in response to some of the, as he saw, more um, revisionist, right wing, soft um, economic policies that are being instituted after the um, Great Leap Forward. Anyway, so uh, in the Cultural Revolution, the Four Olds campaign uh, launched in 1966 is the peak of cultural change policy. Artifacts and temples were destroyed, um, except, of course, the Forbidden Palace in Beijing. And that was only uh, survived because it was protected explicitly by Zhou Enlai, um, ordering PLA troops to surround it. Books were burned, roads were renamed, um, the traffic lights uh, were switched around, at least I think they were, sometimes people deny that. But the idea of, of red meaning stop was seen to be un-Marxist. And so um, red meant go for a little while. And I think they changed it back because it was confusing and dangerous. 
But anyway, the, the point being that these traditional cultures were being targeted um, and changed, both in a kind of uh, artifacts and books sort of way, but also thinking even more broadly than that. Road names certainly um, was a big thing. Jiang Qing was at the forefront of this campaign as an enthusiastic proponent of the Cultural Revolution, uh, but also um, she was in particular part of the, the cultural element of that. So she was in charge of censoring music, art and theatre, uh, works with feudal, feudal values like romance, wealth, property, um, respect for the ancestors, they were all banned. Um, and uh, in 1969, Jiang Qing actually joined the Politburo, later became a member of the Gang of Four. So bringing that influence um, ever kind of higher. The Polit, uh, sorry, she also used the Cultural Revolution to purge anyone that knew about her past in Shanghai. So it was also used as a personal tool of advancement. Um, and that does, um, that, uh, that was done to obviously expand her power base perhaps with an eye to taking power herself in the future. Mao, of course, was old and unwell by this stage, and the Gang of Four certainly pitched themselves as, as the next leaders of China. And it does call into question whether the Cultural Revolution was a genuine attempt to change the culture of China or more of an extension of a personal battle for who's going to have most influence in China once Mao has, um, has died. Later, of course, Jiang Qing claimed actually it was all Mao's idea when she was caught um, and accused of things after the, the Cultural Revolution. Um, she said, I was Chairman Mao's dog. Whoever he asked me to bite, I bit. So the Cultural Revolution and Jiang Qing uh, are super controversial um, in China uh, for their role in trying to suppress old culture and bring about new culture. Um, as I said, uh, uh, the suppression is is extreme. Performances of foreign works were banned and um, directors, some directors and writers were blacklisted, others were attacked. Um, quite a few took their own lives as a result. All new plays and operas and anything like that had to glorify communism. You either It was either made revolutionary or it was banned. There were eight new model dramas. I'll just whiz through these for you. Uh, number one, I would do some of them for you. Uh, Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy, which is an undercover soldier, uh, in which an undercover soldier infiltrated bandits. Uh, the Legend of the Red Lantern was about communist resistance to the Japanese invasion. The Romance on the Milky Way, um, in which a groom says he'll pick a lucky day for a wedding, uh, but he's told off for being superstitious. Uh, the Red Detachment of Women was a particular uh, favourite. Uh, it was an opera that had been written already and that was made into a film during the Cultural Revolution uh, in which a poor peasant escapes to become an army leader. Uh, and The East is Red, uh, a dance epic, um, the story of the rise of the uh, CCP, um, the Communist Party of China, um, in which songs claim that Mao was the people's saviour and that without communism, uh, there would be no China. Without the Communist Party, rather, there would be no China. Propaganda teams toured the country um, showing films. By 1974, um, peasants had watched, uh, were watching 10 films a year, and it was estimated that Taking Tiger Mountain had been seen by 7.3 billion people, or that it had been seen seven times by each person in the People's Republic of China. And there are comments um, about people uh, from the time saying, oh yeah, we watched a lot of films, but they were the same film uh, a lot. So that lack of diversity um, was a big problem um, in terms of entertainment value. We'll come back to change continuity um, at, at uh, when we've thought about religion. So just the religion bit then, and these are about attacks on Buddhism, Confucianism, Christianity, Islam, and ancestor worship, uh, really any religion, therefore, um, and also the link between anti-religious policies and the government's attempts to impose ideological uniformity on the on the Chinese people. So I think there's a huge overlap here with cultural change, this idea of ideological uniformity, getting people to believe and act and think in the same way is really just, uh, yeah, it's just a different stripe on the rainbow of, of cultural change. So the Communist Party, um, as common amongst Marxists, thought that religion was part of the old feudal capitalist system. Um, However, the added dimension here is that Christianity is particularly seen as a Western influence in China and um, designed or imposed by Western countries to try and create a more 
subservient Chinese people. And uh, to an extent, that is how it had operated um, in the 19th century. So, yeah, there's a, a kind of a painful retrospective Western view there, I guess. Um, Buddhism and uh, Islam were also seen as problems because there were political challenges to the Communist Party as they seized power. So each of them is uh, persecuted. Uh, and let's pop through those um, individually now. I'll start with Buddhism, and sometimes called Lamaism, L-A-M-A, Lamaism, um, which is a regional form of Buddhism um, led, of course, by the Dalai Lama um, in Tibet. So we're talking about Tibetan Buddhism. You can call it Lamaism. Um, so as I said, uh, big in Tibet, uh, the 1950 reunification campaign, um, monasteries were attacked, monks were sent to the Lao Gai because these Buddhist monks and Buddhism generally in Tibet was sticking up for an independent Tibet. Um, partly, uh, Tibet is secured to um, uh, you know, mm, to make China secure against India, on which it borders, and the Buddhism was seen as a threat because of the Buddhists in India too, and there was seen as being a cultural link there. Um, but uh, also, um, it's worth saying it's just it's just about imposing communism on the people. And I guess if we're going to be fair, um, a belief perhaps that ideologically um, communism would lead to better lives of people than, than Buddhism. Let's give them the credit for thinking that. Um, however, it's fair to say that despite uh, this imposition, uh, there was consistent and persistent resistance to communism in Tibet. Uh, the 1959 uprising is the best example of that. Um, in which uh, the Communist Party's response was to beat priests and nuns, to convert monasteries to barracks um, uh, or bring them under state control um, under the headline of the Communist, uh, sorry, the Chinese Buddhist Association, CBA, the Chinese Buddhist Association. The Dalai Lama um, fled Tibet at that time. And then uh, the famine uh, in the late 50s was particularly severe in, in Tibet um, and there were further attacks uh, on Buddhists um, there as a result. Uh, 6,000 monasteries were closed. However, at the end of all that, Buddhism is still the most widely practiced religion in China to this day. And that's a theme we're going to come back to. Um, Confucianism. Um, so where Confucianism. Uh, Confucius was a fifth century Chinese philosopher. He promoted things like family ties, respect and ancestor worship. His whole thing was about stability and um, accepting your place uh, in society. He had shaped the thinking of the Chinese people for two and a half thousand years. And the Communist Party condemned him before 1949 and consistently attack him through their period in power. Um, in the Cultural Revolution, memorials to Confucius were destroyed. His name was used to suggest opponents were backward or reactionary. Um, Lin Biao, for example, there's an attack on him in 1973. Confusingly, that attack on Lin Biao in 1973 was actually targeted at Zhou Enlai, but they were both being um, linked with Confucian, uh, Confucianism and Confucianism um, to suggest that they were not properly communist. Um, it's fair to say that in this area, there's a, there's a real impact, um, particularly perhaps on young people and perhaps particularly on, on those in urban areas as well. However, it is uh, a hugely embedded um, traditional way of thinking, and you can still see it uh, present in Chinese thought to this day. Linked to that, ancestor worship and the New Year Festival were both condemned as representing old China, um, representing loyalty to the family rather than loyalty to the party, uh, to the nation. Um, they discovered the Qingming Festival, where people returned to the graves of their ancestors, um, and they replaced that instead with the National Memorial Day to honour the dead of the Civil War. But um, you might remember that there were protests uh, after the death of Zhou Enlai in 1976, um, and these were timed to co coincide, perhaps, perhaps not a coincidence, these were timed to happen at the Qingming Festival, um, owing a lot to ancestor worship and respect for um, Zhou Enlai as, as an elder of the nation, as it were. So it's kind of almost like a fusing, really, uh, there of uh, ancestor worship, Confucianism and communist respect. Qingming is spelt Q-I-N-G-M-I-N-G. 
Uh, Christianity, um, as I said, seems to have been a Western influence. Protestant and Catholic churches were both um, seen as having kind of brought something from a different place to China and tried to impose it on there. And so the Communist Party tried to replace those with um, uh, a church of their own, which they created, the Patriotic Church, as a way of controlling Christianity uh, within China. The state, for instance, would be in charge of appointing clergy. But attendance at those churches, unsurprisingly, uh, was low. Um, schools and hospitals that have been set up by churches were taken over by the state. Missionaries were forced out of the country. Um, the, uh, in 1951, for example, just sort of skipping around notes here, sorry. In 1951, uh, there were 3,222 missionaries in the People's Republic of China. By 1953, uh, there were only 364. Um, in 1953, uh, the Protestant Church came under the authority of the Three Self Patriotic Movement, and then an attempt to do the same to the Catholic Church in 1957 led to direct conflict with the Pope uh, and the Catholic Church. Um, and therefore, the Communist Party attacked Catholic hospitals for treating people like guinea pigs, and uh, Catholic schools for helping uh, the United States in the Korean War, um, and children's homes for starving and torturing people, a massive propaganda campaign against Catholicism. And the Pope therefore threatened to excommunicate any priests who cooperated with the Chinese Communist Party. So um, the Protestant Church sort of subsumed the Catholic Church, um, persecuted through the 50s. Most of the missionaries pack up and leave. However, um, the Christian Church still operated in China in secret um, through this period. Um, and um, it's really blossomed in the last kind of 20 years out of those seeds that remained all the time. So persecuted, um, oppressed, suppressed but not removed. Uh, similar story, I guess, in Islam. Um, Islam, the Islamic areas of China are mostly in the northwest, Xinjiang province, but also Gansu and Qinghai province. Uh, the religious leaders there have a huge influence on society. Um, and that is why it's seen, similar to Buddhism in Tibet, seems being a, um, a political threat because of the leadership, the alternative leadership that's offered. And of course, they're near to Islamic areas of the Soviet Union. So in the 60s, that's a, a, an area of, of contention and concern for the CCP leaders. Um, therefore, mosques are closed down. Schools teaching the Quran were replaced with schools teaching Marxism. Uh, land was taken from mosques and redistributed. Um, resistors to all those policies were sent to the Lao guy. And the government um, also uh, encouraged and actually continues to encourage, I believe, Han Chinese um, to emigrate to the Northwest and settle there to try and dilute the Muslim population and they build roads into Xinjiang to try and connect it um, more to the rest of the country. Um, Cultural Revolution made things worse there. Like in Tibet, mosques were turned into stables and barracks. Leaders were tortured or given jobs like cleaning sewers to demean them. Um, and, uh, and as I said, in the 60s in particular, that's all linked to concerns about Soviet Union, who would have really liked to have expanded into northwest China um, and claim the oil and gas reserves that um, were there. And by that stage, they'd fallen out with China. They weren't seen as being communist brothers. They were seen as being rivals. But all that said, um, resistance in these regions um, actually over time kind of led the, the Communist Party to be more respectful and circumspect in their policies for a while, at least. Um, still today, famously in Xinjiang province, the Communist Party is seen as being persecuting the, the Uyghur people, the, the Islamic Muslim minorities that live there. Well, they're majorities in those areas, but they're uh, minorities in China as a whole. So um, change or continuity, success or failure, in terms of culture um, and religion, there are um, huge successes in, in, in many areas. And uh, but I would say that it's easier to change the appearance of China and the appearance of people's beliefs than the actual beliefs on the inside. So there's considerable success on the surface, um, attendance at these uh, religious uh, places of worship is reduced. Um, there's state control over um, the religions in some areas. Likewise, in terms of the cultural change and the censorship works really well, but in each area, there's persistent kind of low level resistance. That means that you wouldn't claim that things are completely changed or perhaps transformed as it's put. So I would say lots of energy and success in making people seem like they are conforming. 
but below the surface, more fundamentally, uh, there's a minority of resistance there that persists through the whole time. Um, thanks for watching. Sorry, it's a long one to finish on, but I hope that series has been useful to you. Um, and uh, see you again, different time.